Let's turn to confession now. The psalmist models a transparent faith with these words. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Now we express our longing for God's leading in our hearts with our own transparent confession. Follow along in this litany. You asked for my hands that you might use them for your purpose. I gave them for a moment, then withdrew them, for the work was hard. You asked for my mouth to speak out against injustice. I gave you a whisper that I might not be accused. You asked for my eyes to see the pain of poverty. I closed them, for I did not want to see. You asked for my life, that you might work through me. I gave a small part, that I might not get too involved. Lord, forgive my calculated efforts to serve you. Only when it's convenient for me to do so, only in those places where it's safe to do so, and only with those who make it easy to do so. Father, forgive me, renew me, send me out as a usable instrument that I might take seriously the meaning of your cross. Amen. But the Lord doesn't leave us in our sin and in our guilt. He gives us assurance and we receive this assurance through the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 where he tells us, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Amen. Now let's, uni let's unify our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Our scripture this morning comes from Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. If you care to read along with your pew Bibles, it's on page 1217. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing and perfect will. The word of the Lord. Now, you may recognize my face. I've been to the, had the privilege of joining you for worship on a number of occasions, but I doubt that you know much about my story and who I am. And if you want to know a little bit about me, one of the most important parts of my life story is when I was in junior high. Junior high was a very intense time of my life. Like most junior highers, I... I faced a lot of bullying, I was pushed around a lot, but for me it was a pretty extreme experience. I was persecuted for my faith, that was the thing that they chose to latch on to. They always, they always find something, something that makes you unique. I was the only kid in my entire class that was willing to admit that he believed in, loved Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior, and so they used that as a way to, to pick on me. And just to point out too, I was pretty overweight at the time, and yet they chose to use my faith as the way to mock me. But, like I said, I faced a lot of verbal abuse, physical abuse, and this went on for a number of years, and it really affected me. But facing bullies is a difficult experience because when you face bullies, you know, people who tease, people who mock, they always have a way of controlling the situation. They're very good at it. So they physically control the situation by making sure they always outnumber you. You know, they always come in in groups to face one or two kids alone. You never see one bully coming coming up and facing, you know, five other kids at a time. They always want to make sure that physically they have the advantage. But they also like to create a pattern where they're in control verbally as well. You know, bullies, they'll find your weaknesses. They'll find ways to to use words, to, to interrupt, to, to pick topics that you're uncomfortable in, to make sure that you're always unsteady, off your feet. They do things to try to get inside of your head. One of the tools that they like to use is this term tattletale. I don't think that's a new term. I'm pretty sure that one's been around for a while, but tattletale. You know, that, that idea of, don't you go running for help, because if you do, Your life is going to be far worse than it is right now because you'll become a tattletale. So they put this fear in your heart of don't don't you dare go run to someone greater than yourself or hope. You'll become a tattletale. As I said, I put up with this for a couple of years. And then I got to a point where I decided I'm done with this. I'm tired of playing this game. Because this game, what it is, it's a predictable pattern where every single day I went to school and I lost. It was predictable. You know exactly how it was going to end up every time because these bullies, they they controlled the situation. They created the pattern that everyone else had to fit into, and I decided I'm not going to fit into this pattern anymore. I want a new pattern. So I did the thing that they said never do. I went and I asked for help. I went to the teachers. I went to the principal. I asked for help. Now, they told me if I asked for help, My life had become far worse than it was. But the truth is, when you turn to somebody who has real authority, when you turn to someone who's bigger than yourself, greater than yourself, when someone with real power and authority enters in onto the scene, the power that these other people seem to have just disappears. And those last few months of my time in junior high were a completely different experience. Because I looked to the one who has real power in that school. 
Now, you might see the direction that I'm going with this story. I'm not just telling you a little bit of my own biography. But every single one of us here, we're locked into, or we were born locked into a pattern. It was a bad pattern. It was a pattern that was set against us. It was a pattern that was set up where we would lose every time, but it wasn't necessarily a pattern that was set up by bullies. It was a pattern that was set up for us by a world corrupted by sin. A pattern that leaves us powerless. And the only way for us to get out of this pattern is to look to someone greater than ourselves. Look to the one who has real authority. And that's God. Our God is a game changer. He comes in, and when he steps into the scene, the pattern of this world with its rules, everything's set up for us to lose and to fail. When God steps into the scene, the rules change. We experience something far greater than the pattern of this world. Now, the pattern of this world, the way it's set up, now there's a lot of different things about the pattern of the world, but one of the things I want to focus on this morning about the pattern of the world is that it keeps us trapped by pursuing after empty pleasures, has us follow after one thing after another, but every single one of them empty. But when we look to the Lord, and as He moves in our hearts and begins to transform us, what we see is something far greater than the empty pleasures of this world. But what we see, as we look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, is that God gives us joy beyond what the world can offer. And that's the message that I see coming from these two verses. There's a lot of things we could say about these two verses. There's a lot that's packed in there. But this is the theme that I want to pull out right now. That God gives us joy beyond what the world can offer. And when I look at these two verses, I see a very logical argument that Paul is making. You know, he's, he's a very logical man. That's the way that he does things. But I see three steps in this logical argument that he's making. First is the motive, second is the method, and third is the result. So those are the three things we're going to be walking through, the movements of his argument. We're looking at the motive, the method, and the result. So Paul begins with the motive. And what he's arguing, and the argument that he's making, what we see is that it is motivated by the mercy of God. That's the motivation that he uses in his argument. Verse 1, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, and I'll stop right there, but he says, let's look to God's mercy. This is the motivation for the argument that he's about to make. And the reason he does this is, first of all, the Apostle Paul has just finished making a very strong argument for the mercy of God. He's proclaimed, he's proven the fact that our God is a merciful God. Mercy that's far beyond our own understanding. But now what he's doing is he's saying, all right, let's take this truth and let's apply it. What does that mean? If God is a merciful God, how are we supposed to live in view of that mercy? And so that's going to be the next thing we're going to look at in a moment. That's the method. But before we do that, I want to ask a question. And that is, why is it important? Why is it important to think about motivation? What's the big deal? Why did, why did he even bother mentioning the mercies of God? Well, motivation has a very strong impact on our practice. You know, the stronger our motivation, the stronger our practice is going to be. It has a very big impact on the way that we live our lives. And I'll give you a simple explanation, a little illustration. We all know the relationship between children and vegetables, don't we? I mean, that's, that's pretty standard. Every once in a while you, you get a kid like mine who his favorite dessert is frozen peas, but the rest of the vegetables he still doesn't seem to get along with. But kids and vegetables, they're not very motivated naturally to eat their vegetables. Now there's a few ways that you could try to inspire your, your child. You could list out for them all of the, the vitamins that are in those vegetables and talk about the health benefits and say, look at you know, the ratio between the, the number of calories and the number of vitamins. This, this is going to be food that's going to make you strong and healthy. And, and it's true. You know, the, vit- the vitamins and everything that's in those vegetables, they are going to be good for your child, but that's probably not going to motivate the, your kid. But 
There's another go-to motivation that parents use when they're trying to get their children to eat vegetables, and that's dessert. You say, you're going to want to finish your dinner because when your dinner is done, we're going to have ice cream. We're going to have cake. If you give them a motivation like that, you might see a difference in their practice. And so I laid out, you know, two different types of motivation. Both are true. But one seems to have more of an impact on the actions of a child. We might be motivated by facts. There might be a kid who listens to, you know, as you list out the vitamins and things that are in there. There might be someone who responds to that. But by and large, we are most motivated by joy. That's the thing that motivates us the most. Now, you can try to motivate people through, you know, fear. You can try to motivate them through a number of different methods. But joy is the most powerful. It's the one that that changes people's actions the most. We notice that the Apostle Paul doesn't say, in view of God's wrath, offer yourselves as living sacrifices. No, our, our God is a God who is wrath. He's a God that doesn't put up with sin and corruption. So it's true, but that's not where he goes for motivation. He turns to the joy of the Lord. He turns, he turns to God's mercy. Because it's when we look to God's mercy that we find that motivation to live out the very next thing. That very next thing that we're going to be looking at. And that's the method. That's the method that we see coming out of here. So what we see... Is How are we supposed to live in view of God's mercy? Well, verse 1 goes on to say, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So, he's trying to use joy. He's trying to use the mercy of God to convince us to offer our lives as living sacrifices. That's the idea that we see coming from here. That's what Paul is trying to encourage us. God is full of mercy, therefore, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. Now, when I was younger and I'd read this passage, I used to think it was very strange that all of a sudden, he's jumping from this idea of sacrifice to worship. You know, it seemed like a random statement, this is your spiritual act of worship. Why, why is he talking about worship? Well, as I started to read my Bible more, I realized that there's a very strong connection between sacrifice and worship, particularly for the Jewish people during the time that the Bible was written. I mean, it was, it was clear as night and day. Sacrifice was fundamental to their worship because they would take the best of who they were, the best of what they had, and they offered that to the Lord. You know, it was animals, it was plants, it was, it was a thing that was the best of what they were able to produce, to grow, to make, and they gave that to the Lord as a way of saying that Lord, I put your pleasure before my own. It's it's different than the pattern of the world that says, think of your own pleasure. All of a sudden, we're seeing this idea of sacrifice, thinking about the pleasure of God above your own pleasure. Because if you had your most fattened calf, that would have been your prized possession. If you were concerned about your own pleasure, you would have kept that for yourself. But if you're more concerned about the pleasure of God, then you would joyfully give that up to the Lord. So that's why we see this idea of living sacrifice as worship, because it's focusing on the glory and the pleasure of God above ourselves. It's it's an act of humility. It's an act of praise. That's why we see this idea of living sacrifice as being our spiritual act of worship. This is what we do nowadays, because we're not bringing animals, we're not... You know, bringing our plants before the Lord, but we're bringing ourselves, our own lives. So living sacrifice, that's, that's the image, that's the phrase that's put before us. And in the church, sometimes we like to use cliched terms because they come from the Bible, so they're good terms, but how often do we th- really think about it? So for example, living sacrifice. We may use that in our language if we're sitting in a Bible study, talk about trying to be a living sacrifice. Maybe in our prayers we use that type of language. But when you think about it, that's a really odd saying, isn't it? A living sacrifice. Because the people during this time when the Bible is written, they knew that every time you made a sacrifice, the thing that you were sacrificing was put to death. 
you know, whether it was the animal, whether it was the plant, sacrifice required death. But now all of a sudden, we're the sacrifice, but we're not a normal sacrifice. We're a living sacrifice. And how is that possible? You know, now this is not a doctrine of the living dead. I know we're getting close to Halloween, but that's not what we see coming from this passage. We see something far greater, something far more powerful from this idea of living sacrifice. Paul explains it when, when he says in verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we see there, I- there is a change taking place. In a sense, there, there is a death that's happening here when we offer ourselves as living sacrifices to the Lord. Because when we offer our lives to the Lord, there is a death. But it's a death to our sin. It's a death to the old pattern of living where we put our pleasures above everything else. There's a death that happens, but simultaneous as that death happens, there's a new life that begins at that same moment. A new life with a new pattern where we think of the glory of God, His pleasure, His glory before our own. There is a new life that takes place at the same moment. And this is all possible and only possible because of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. In the church, we make a big deal about Jesus Christ, about the cross. And and that is for a very good reason. Because this idea of, of dying and yet living is possible because Jesus Christ himself When he died on the cross, he died, and he died with our sin. So that nature of ours died with Jesus. And yet he didn't just stay dead, did he? Three days later, he rose again from the dead. He came to new life. And so his life becomes our life. And so yes, there is a death that happens in the sacrifice. But it's a living sacrifice because we are now alive in Jesus Christ. So when we put our hope, our faith, our confidence in Him, there's a radical transformation that happens. There's a radical transformation that happens in each of our lives. So, as I said, there's an argument that we're going through. We've got the motive, we've got the method, but what's the result? We're supposed to become transformed by the work of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in our lives. But what's the result? What what does it really look like for us to be transformed, to be living sacrifices? Well, one of the results that Paul lays out for us is real discernment. That's what we gain when we become a living sacrifice. We, We receive real discernment. And discernment is just a fancy way of saying, you know, a clear perception of what's around you, to be able to see things clearly. What we see in verse 2, we see these words, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Because before you're transformed, you're not able to really understand the will of God, who He is, the way that He's wired, the things that please Him. You can't please him if you don't understand. In in order to understand, we need to have real discernment. And so when I think of this transformation that happens with our perceptions, it makes me think of of hiking in woods. Like if you ever go hiking and you you get to go into a, a large, deep, dense forest, you need to make sure that you stay on the trail because you don't have to go very far from the trail before you get lost. Because there's so many trees around that block your view. You don't have to go very far before the only thing that you can see is maybe a hundred yards at the best. Because there's so much that's blocking your eyes, that's blocking your vision. Well, being lost in woods like that is like being stuck in the old pattern of the world. There, there's too much that's in our way that you can't really see what's going on. And so you might get yourself into a place where... All of a sudden, you don't know where your campsite is, and you have absolutely no idea how to find it because your vision is so obscured. And yet, for us spiritually, when we become a living sacrifice, 
When this transformation happens in our hearts and in our minds, all of a sudden we have real discernment, the, the ability to perceive the will of God. And so to use this hiking analogy, it's like being lifted above the trees and being able to see the entire horizon and looking around and saying, oh yeah, so there's, there's that mountain over there and that river, oh, th there's, there's my trail and I can follow, there's my campsite. You know, when you have real discernment, all of a sudden you have the ability to see things that you would not have been able to see before. When we're transformed, we gain real discernment into the will of God. Now let me give you a, a very real illustration of what this type of discernment might look like. Because again, it's, it's easy to use cliches, you know, being able to perceive the will of God. It's a nice idea, but really what does that look like? I want to go back to the story of, of me in junior high, my experience with bullies in my, in my school. Now, if I was stuck in the old pattern of the world, when I started to gain some power in the school because of the decisions I made to talk to teachers and principals. If I was stuck in the old pattern of the world, my first thought would have been revenge. It would have been the idea of, look, it used to be that when they were walking down the hall, I needed to step aside, but now when I walk down the hall, they're the ones who are stepping aside, and they have done a lot to hurt me, and they have caused a lot of pain in my life, and now what I'm looking for is justice. I want to cause as much pain, no, I want to cause more pain in their life than they caused me because that's what justice is, isn't it? Justice is a, is a real idea, that's a good idea. You know, we applaud in, in stories and movies when, when the villain gets what was coming to them. They're up and coming. That's what I want right now. I want these people to get what they deserve. And it'd be really easy to make an argument that sounds plausible if you're stuck in the old pattern of the world. Because the idea of justice is, it is a real idea. You know, when something has done something to hurt you, they deserve to make a payment to correct that. But the pattern of the world is looking for revenge. But as God was working in my own heart and transforming me and helping me to gain some real discernment, I started to see a new pattern, things that I hadn't seen before. I started to realize that these guys who would pick on me every single day, they were experiencing in their lives far more pain than I was already experiencing. I could try to dish out as much pain as I wanted to them, but it was, would never compare to the kind of pain that they experienced in their homes. Because I started to realize every single one of these boys that picked on me, they came from broken homes. Most of their families were divorced. The parents were divorced. They were split. One, one family in particular, one of those kids, his mother was murdered when he was at a very young age. I can assure you, that when they went home, they experienced plenty of pain already. They also realized, too, that when they went home, it wasn't just divorce. It wasn't just the idea of having a single parent. But they also experienced a lot, a lot of physical and verbal abuse from their own parents. They experienced... what. I mean, I thought I had it bad when I was in school. But what they received when they went home was far worse. They were taunted with things that were far more severe. They were beaten far more strongly in their own homes by their own parents than what they ever did to me. So when we talk about patterns... When we begin to talk about being stuck in the pattern of the world, I can't think of a stronger example than that, where somebody whose life is filled with so much pain of their parents doing things that they don't know anything else than to go to school and do it to the people who are smaller than they are. 
They're doing the only thing that they know because that's what they've been taught by their own parents. And so the new pattern, the transformation that God was doing in my heart was saying, if there's going to be anything that is going to stop this pain from happening, the only thing that's going to stop this pattern of the world is the mercies of God. The thing that Paul starts us off with, he says, in view of God's mercy. It's the mercy of God that's going to say, yeah, I deserve some justice against these kids. But Jesus Christ deserved justice against the people who crucified him, didn't he? But he chose, he chose to be compassionate. He chose to show them mercy, not giving what they deserve, but giving them something that they didn't deserve. Love, compassion, mercy, and peace. That is far more powerful than the verbal and physical taunts that people are able to dish out. Far more powerful. And so I realized with the last few months that I had in junior high, instead of getting revenge, it was to take those last weeks that I had to show them God's mercy. And to be used by God because I was becoming a living sacrifice someone that was living according to his will. That was an opportunity for me to be used as a demonstration of God's mercy. So if it was his will, they might be broken from this pattern that they were locked into. So the last question I want to ask you is, is it worth it? This idea of becoming a living sacrifice, putting the pleasure of God before yourself, is it worth it? I'll say yes, it definitely is. Now there might be a danger to think that just because you live for the pleasure of God, it means that's the end of your own pleasure. But that is so far from the truth. In fact, the reverse is true. Because when you think about the things that we read in the newspapers, we see on television, the news of, of people who are extremely successful according to the pattern of the world. You know, celebrities, athletes, people who have everything the world can offer them. Fame, money, wh- you name it. And then you see these same people who are experiencing scandals, even go so far as suicide. That tells me that the pattern in the world, even if it offered everything that it had to give you, that's not really going to make you happy. I mean, it's, it's pretty ironic that if you live for your own pleasure then you're going to have a pretty unsatisfying life. And yet, in the new pattern, when we live for the pleasures of God, we receive a pleasure that is far greater than what the world can offer for us. We receive the pleasures of God himself, knowing that we're able to bring delight to the one who created the heavens and the universe. Just us little individuals we can praise, we can give pleasure to a God like that. That's an incredible experience. And what he gives for us in return is transformation. We'll point out something that's interesting. The transformation that happens here is not a new transformation, but what it actually is is a restoration to where we once lived as the people of God all the way back in the Garden of Eden. The transformation is a restoration of God's perfect and pleasing will on this earth. And that's what we see, this language. The end of verse 2, it says, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's going to be our new reality when we become transformed more and more. And when Jesus Christ returns, that transformation, that restoration will be complete. And God knows perfection more than anyone else because He's the one who created perfection. And he's the one that is perfection. And he wants to share those with us. So, what we see is an interesting sandwich here. In the middle is sacrifice. But Paul, Paul is wise. And he puts on either side of that sacrifice, joy. Because on one side we said the mercies of God. Those wonderful, powerful mercies of God on one side. But then on the other side, the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. 
That's our motivation and that's our end goal. That's where we start and that's where we end. When we offer our lives to the Lord, putting His pleasure before our own pleasures, but not for the end of our pleasures, but for the beginning of brand new pleasures that can only be made true for us because of the amazing work of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these two verses right here. And you've packed so much in these two verses, and we've only been able to unpack some of what we could learn from these. But we pray that you, you do that work in our heart, that transformation, because we can't be the ones to transform ourselves. We're trapped in the old pattern of the world, but you've done something for us that we can't. You've, you've begun this work of transformation. You've given us a new heart. You've given us a new life. We pray that we experience the reality of that transformation more and more every day. And help us to have a real discernment of your will because your will works in ways that are completely outside the box of this world. But help us to see the ways that we can live over and above the pattern of the world. And as we live in your pattern, as we live according to your will, let it bring transformation, not just in our lives, but in the lives of those who are around us. We thank you for your word. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let's stand and respond to a reflection on God's word by singing, Take my life and let it be.